Hi, this is Clive Priddle, and you're watching The Current. Today, uh, we're joined by Devlin Barrett. Devlin, hi. Hi. Uh, and we're delighted to have you because here we are. It's the back end of September, and we're, uh, we're feeling the political sap rising ahead of the election around the corner now. It's, uh, it's starting to get feisty. The first debate is around the corner. And your book, um, uh, brilliantly timely publishing, uh, is called October Surprise, and it's the story of 2016. But before we get to the specifics of your book, um, let me just ask you in general about the whole idea of an October surprise. Uh, where did that come from? Is there is there an original October surprise? There actually is. So I mean, it's always sort of existed in some level in politics, but there there is a person in an event that coined the term October surprise. It actually dates back to the 1980 U.S. presidential campaign between Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. And it, it was a weird way to deploy it at the time because it was essentially one theory of an October surprise on, on, the, on the part of one campaign that was raised. It was an accusation that was just sort of leveled. And it quickly spawned a sort of counter theory of, of a different October surprise by the opposing candidate. And, and frankly, there's never really been much substance, not much evidence to really prove either of those theories correct. It may be that the year that started the term October surprise, in fact, had no October surprise. Um, but it, it became a very popular topic for a very specific thing that can happen late in campaigns. And it's the kind of thing that campaign consultants sweat and worry about and, and, and stress about right up to the very end because it's so uncontrollable, it's so unpredictable when it happens to a campaign. Um, and it's the kind of thing reporters often dread because one of the nat one of the types of October surprise that can be inflicted in, in, into an election is one where an accusation is leveled and there's simply not enough time to process it, to understand it, to essentially check it out, run it to ground and know how important, whether it's important or not. Um, okay, so, that's October surprise. So, so that sets up um, the, the so the October surprise has mythical origins in the 1980s, uh, and is much talked about as a as a potential. It's the it's the looming ghost that that actually rarely, in fact, shows up in an election cycle. But as your book shows, in 2016, it really arrived. Uh, we had the full specter, and. Um, I want you first just to explain how you're sure that what happened in 2016, which is James Comey's intervention in the election, how we can know for certain that that really changed events. The best evidence of it is, is simply in the data. The polling data shows that before Comey's letter uh, reopening an investigation into Hillary Clinton, uh, Comey released that letter on October 28th, and before that letter, Hillary Clinton generally had about a six-point lead in the polls. And what happened was you saw that lead uh, basically lose about three points in the immediate aftermath of that letter. And most importantly, she lost significant points in the swing states, in a lot of the key states that uh, were so critical to winning, winning it all. And while the Comey uh, letter had an effect of about three percentage points. In in three key states, Trump won by much less than one percent of the vote. So you could never prove definitively that Comey made Donald Trump the president. But you can say that there is a very good basis to argue that the data shows that Comey's letter had the biggest impact at the crucial time to make that to lead to that end result. And the Clinton campaign <laughs> never had time to recover from it. They never they never were able to recover from it. That's that's very true. And one of the quirks of the of why they were never able to recover is because the Clinton campaign came to believe by the time you get to late October, remember they have been dealing with the Clinton email investigation and, and sort of the, the cloud of that for so so long in that campaign. Their, their polling data suggests that the more the conversation was about her emails, forget the topic, forget the specifics. If we're talking about the emails, the Clinton, came, Clinton campaign came to believe that she, was that she was losing ground because the more people heard about emails, the less they liked her. And there's, again, there's, there's fairly good polling data to, to back that up. 
so that so it was the nightmare of all nightmares to have the subject that they didn't want talked about brought back into public consciousness by the, the chief of the FBI in front of television cameras nationwide. Exactly. And it the Comey letter goes out 11 days before the election. And one of the classic definitions of an October surprise is it happens when there's so little time that a campaign can't really recover from it, can't really counter whatever the accusation or information is. And in that sense, Comey's letter was kind of quintessentially an October surprise because there was less than two weeks left and people were already voting. The 2016 set of circumstances is really particular, isn't it? I mean, the October surprise in 2016 is, it's, firstly, it's supremely well targeted. Um, you know, this, this isn't just uh, an attack on a Clinton surrogate or somebody who, even a vice president, it's right, it nails the candidate in an area where she is perceived to be vulnerable, even if that turns out to be an error. Um, and so it's quite unlike anything that we're experiencing in, in 2020 so far. Uh, so we, we, we're talking in the wake of the sad passing of uh, Justice Ginsburg. Um, and some people might say, well, is that an October surprise? But, but it isn't really, is it? Because we don't know how that plays politically. No. And, and it's funny you mention that because just in the last few weeks, a couple of people have said to me because they know about the book. Well, is this an October surprise? Is this an October surprise? And what I keep saying is, well, first of all, it's September. So I think that the <laughs> immediate answer is no. But more importantly, we're still far enough away from the election that the kind of undigestible impact isn't really possible. And if you remember, a good example of that is that is if you look think back to early October 2016, there are some very surprising things that happen but they happen in early October and they end up not being as important ultimately in the long run. And, and I'm referring to the Access Hollywood tape that came out of uh, President Trump making uh, offensive statements uh, about how he treats women and the government statement saying that Russia was hacking the election. Now, both of those things were incredible surprises that happened in October, but they ultimately did not move the needle the same way that, that Comey's letter did in large part because it happened right at the end of October. So we will have to wait for the better part of another month to know for sure if we're really going to see an October surprise that would turn the 2020 election in the way that the one in 2016 did. Well, and one of the things that's kind of funny about that is I think whether we consciously know it or not, I think the experience of 2016 has really weighed on a lot of voters. And so I certainly in my conversations, feel like a lot more voters are attuned to the idea of an October surprise this time around than they were that time. You know, if you think back to the way October 2016 was shaking, shaking up, you know, a lot of people really firmly believed that Hillary Clinton was a lock to win that election. And judging by his own statements, James Comey believed she was a lock to win that election. This time, I think, in large part because of 2016, I think the public is much more attuned to the notion of like, is someone going to try and trick us at the end? Is there going to be some weird development that makes us all like suddenly change our minds about something? So I think, interestingly, I think there is actually more awareness of the idea. And in a, in a strange way, that might actually diminish the effect of any October surprise that happens, because I think now there's actually, there's actually more people looking for it. So, so do you think, um, do you think the political teams, the campaign teams for the Democrats and the Republicans have spent four years trying to come up with an October surprise, you know, trying to build their own little sort of weapon of destruction that they can release at the end of the campaign to do precisely this? Well, sort of, because if you think about what it is, it's usually some type of accusation or, or a revelation about something that happened. And, and no one remembers this anymore because it ended up, I think, not having a huge effect. But back in the 2000 presidential, U.S. presidential election, for example, just days before the election, someone came forward to reveal that George W. Bush had an old uh, DWI arrest, uh, an old drunk driving arrest. And at the time, that was obviously a very big deal, and people took it very seriously and thought that was, you know, to some, in some, to some degree, dirty pool in the process because you're announcing this thing very late. Um, but in the end, it didn't matter very much. And so some of these things, you can, you can game them out, you can try and plan one, you can try and execute one, and it may come off as well as can be expected, but it 
isn't necessarily going to have the same effect just because people don't care as much. Um, so when we talk about an October surprise this year, a lot of it depends on, well, what is it and where does it come from? Because those are the two things that sort of can create an impact. So if it feels like it comes from within a campaign, people are going to dismiss it as politicking. And that's what makes 2016 so incredible, is that um, the, the October surprise is delivered by a man and indeed an organization that presents itself as being absolutely impartial, absolutely apolitical, and indeed uh, a servant of the entire country, you know, the FBI. Right. So, so how on God's green earth did the FBI get itself in a situation that it would even, even tiptoe towards tilting an election like this? It seems like every instinct should have told them not to do it. So what the hell did six foot seven James Comey think he was doing striding across that piece of lawn? Believe it or not, he thought he was protecting himself and the FBI. I mean, that, that seems very counterintuitive because it is very counterintuitive. He thought that if it came out after the election, that the FBI had known about these, this new tranche of emails that were found on former Congressman Anthony Weiner's laptop, if it came out after the election that the FBI had known that and not said anything publicly, that Republicans would accuse the FBI of having delivered uh, the White House to Hillary Clinton, that they helped her win. And they were very afraid of that scenario. They, and they frankly did not really contemplate, by their own admission, they never really contemplated a scenario in which Trump might win and, and what that might say about them and what and their decisions. So he thought he was protecting these institutions, particularly the FBI and the Justice Department. Um, but that shows, I think, in, I think it's safe to say that he had too much faith in the polls too, and, and too little understanding necessarily, perhaps, of how much of an impact the FBI's voice could have in an election that close to election day. So that's one of the things that came across to me in the book is um, that the uh, the FBI and indeed other other elements of the Justice Department. This is not a book uh, solely about the FBI. It's uh, it's about justice. It's about other investigations that uh, are running. That a lot of these people would consider themselves apolitical or outside of politics. They may have their individual political preferences, but they they would regard their work as being absolutely without political um, intent necessarily. Um, and yet the, they walked into a, a political firestorm here and were determinative in terms of the outcome. So what, what happened there? Is the FBI um, clueless about politics and, and did it just get caught out? Or has the world changed in some way that nobody now can be outside of politics when the froth of an election really gets going? I, I do think that in some key respects, the FBI did not have good political instincts in that moment. Um, certainly, the FBI is full of very smart people and uh, very thoughtful people. But I think what they lacked in that key moment was enough senior level officials who were you know, sort of steeped in the world of politics and the world of campaigns, at least from an investigative standpoint. You know, that the Bureau has become, in the years since 9-11, a very national security focused organization. And what you had was, a, at that time in 2016, was a group of folks who were national security experts who were frankly not as adept and attuned to domestic U.S. politics. So I think there is, there is a degree of a lack of understanding on their part as to how much of an effect they could have. But I also think, frankly, there's a, there was a degree of, and I think these two things go hand in hand, to be honest. I think a lot of them, because they personally could not contemplate voting for Trump, could not contemplate a lot of other Americans voting for him. And I think they did not foresee that the line between Trump and Clinton was, was closer than it was in terms of votes. And so when they end up moving that line by making their announcement, suddenly the line actually, the actual votes actually shift into a position of, of his winning instead of her winning. And I, I, I don't think that they really understood how close they were to the cliff edge, if that makes much sense, um, because I think, I think they were much closer to the edge than they realized. 
So they were in their bubble in the way that other people people were in their respective bubbles and they just, right. they just didn't see this. They didn't understand the impact they could have. Um, so I, I, think, I think that in itself is fascinating. But as your book makes clear, there are actually two things going on prior to the 2016 election, each of which had the capacity to be an October surprise, a hugely detrimental story to one or other of the candidates. And there was one, there was one each. So for Clinton, right. it was the email server. And, and that story that just wouldn't go away and then suddenly it gets elevated by Comey and it brings her down in the poll right. um, fatally, it turns out. Right. But there was another story too that was also bubbling and, and could have had almost the same effect detrimentally to Donald Trump, which is the Russia right. investigation. So how come Clinton got skewered by hers and Trump somehow didn't by his? So a lot of the answers to that are a bit bureaucratic and for that reason kind of unsatisfying. One is that at that time, you're talking about late 2016, the Trump-Russia investigation is, is really in its infancy. And they're still trying to understand exactly who the cast of characters are, what they're up to or not up to, and who they know. So on that level, it's, it's less likely to become a public matter because they're just starting out. But it's also what's called a counterintelligence investigation primarily, which means that they're even more inclined to keep the outside world from knowing about it. Contrast that with the Clinton case where, where Jim Comey has actually closed the Clinton investigation in July. And what they really want at the FBI at that point is they'd really rather just not deal with the Clinton email investigation anymore. They complain about it to each other a lot. They complain they still have to answer questions to Congress about it. And so, the other part of this that, that sort of drives the Clinton investigation in a way that the Trump-Russia investigation doesn't get driven until you get to the following year is that the Clinton email investigation essentially has its origins in Congress and a congressional investigation of Hillary Clinton. So they were always going to be on top of that part of it. The Trump-Russia investigation did not begin in Congress and sort of came to the FBI through other channels and slowly grew to be of interest to Congress and to be an issue, but that hadn't happened by the time you go to election day. Now, there are plenty of people who make the argument that the FBI was being fundamentally unfair to Hillary Clinton by talking about her case and not talking about Trump's. And, you know, there's a degree of fairness to that in part because one of the things Comey did was he kept talking about the Clinton case. You know, all these things he did, which went against Justice Department practice, he did in her case, but not Trump's and not, not any others. And so I think it raises a very valid question of, well, why is it that you only do these things for Hillary Clinton when Hillary Clinton is under investigation? And I think the, the answer is ultimately, I, I don't think you can look that deep inside anyone's heart, but I do think that he had sort of committed himself to being unusually unusually and exceptionally, and some would say dangerously transparent about everything in the Clinton investigation. And it became a thing that uh, controlled him at times more than he controlled it. And he, and he came to fear the consequences of a bad outcome. So there was a sort of selective radical transparency going on uh, in, yes. uh, in the FBI, which, which worked very well on one side of the ledger and somehow was not applied to the other. Um, right, and, and it, it was, it's one of the great ironies of that time period that he couldn't stop talking about one case and, and never really started talking about the other. So I wanna, I wanna now ask you to, um, to take a step back from uh, the intricacies of what happened in that October, because frankly, people should enjoy that story in your book um, because it's it's wonderful Byzantine characters uh, you know some some low fast thrown in for for good fun some extremely dodgy British intelligence information uh, it's really got a lot but um, let me talk about let me ask you about uh, the functioning of if you like the justice departments I don't just mean the, the the single justice department but all of the all of the departments that contribute to our sense of justice in this country including mm -hmm. of course the FBI um, and and why 
it was possible in 2016 for all of them in different ways to end up being very politicized. Because as you point out in the book, it wasn't just the FBI who, uh, who got caught up in this maelstrom. Um, there was an enormous amount of distrust between FBI and justice. Uh, and in a sense, it, it feels like everybody is, is playing a political game at a time when it is most uh, potentially disruptive right before an election. Has this always been so? Uh, it doesn't feel like it has. And so what has happened? What's happened to justice? What's happened to the, you know, the, the good career civil servants who come into law enforcement thinking that they are going to step outside of politics and yet suddenly here they all are, clustered around an election, pulling and shoving it so that they actually influence the outcome. How did that happen? So it's a lot of factors, uh, some of which are, are not factors that the Bureau or the Justice Department can control. But some of them really can. And I, I think one key issue is that in past elections and in, in past years, there, have, there has existed a better relationship between the head of the FBI and the head of the Justice Department. In 2016, what you have is the head of the FBI being Jim Comey and the head of the Justice Department being Loretta Lynch. And Loretta Lynch believes there's a good relationship. There. They go back years with each other. They worked cases together in, in New York you know, decades earlier as young prosecutors. But inside the FBI, the senior leadership doesn't particularly like the senior officials. Don't They don't particularly like the senior officials at the Justice Department. And it's unspoken, but it's a problem. So when the Clinton case comes to a resolution, the FBI basically decides, we'll do it ourselves. And part of that is due to Loretta Lynch's mistake of, of having that tarmac conversation with Bill Clinton. But frankly, they were the FBI was already planning on going alone, going it alone before that meeting. So to a certain degree, that was just a convenient excuse for what they already wanted to do. And and I think one of the big takeaways of 2016 is whether whether you speak or not before, right before an election, if you have an attorney general and an FBI director who don't really get along and don't really ultimately trust each other when the going gets rough, bad things are likely to result. And that's really, I think, one of the, the, the long-term lessons of this. And I think one of the ways in which they all got caught a little bit flat-footed was they knew they had a political uh, grenade on their hands. They knew it could blow up in their faces if they weren't careful. But that fear generated a heightened degree of suspicion and distrust of the people around them, whether it's within their own department or you know across the street at the FBI or vice versa. And over time, that sort of distrust eroded the relationship to the point where you get the FBI basically on its own and the Justice Department seemingly not able to control their own FBI. I'm going to suggest that maybe there are a couple other things that uh, added to the explosive power of that grenade. Yes. Um, why didn't Congress do a better job of of, temp, of tempering this down as opposed to blowing it up? And how about you guys in the media? Um, how sure. good a job did you do in terms of uh, giving people a perspective on this story? Or did you just throw a little gasoline on the embers? So I, I think those are, I think no one covered themselves in glory in 2016. I think that's like the, the basic takeaway. Um, I think the relationship, I think Congress has had a, a negative and corrosive effect on investigations that involve politics for a number of years. You know, depending on who you talk to in the Justice Department, they can point you back to different cases over the course of the Obama administration and before that they think show the degree to which Congress keeps pushing the Justice Department to be more political and more sort of vindictive and, and score settling for whatever party's in power. And I think over the long run, you know, and any one case doesn't blow up the ship. But I think one of the things that was going on up until 2016 that we didn't really understand effectively at the time was the degree to which the ship had been taking on water for a while. And we were making the ship more unstable. And by we, I mean sort of Congress and, and the Justice Department were, were making the ship more unstable without really realizing, without really looking in the bottom of the boat and seeing how much water was in there. Now for the press, I think it's a slightly different issue, which is because I think the press had a, a kind of shiny object problem all through 
the election. And the email case, the email investigation into Hillary Clinton was always going to be a big story. It's, it's a presidential candidate under investigation by the FBI uh, for possible misuse of classified information. At the same time, that gets overlaid with Russia hacking emails and releasing them. And frankly, most of the email releases were pretty dull. I mean, one of the things that I, I think gets lost in the conversation now is, yeah, but do you remember what any of those WikiLeaks emails were? Like, does anyone remember what the substance of those emails were? Um, I do because I had to write a quote, just to be clear. But, uh, you know, I think the average person, even the average well-informed voter, would be hard-pressed to say what was the point of those email, you know, those stolen email releases to begin with. And I think part of what we have to do better, meaning the press has to do better, is to the degree that stolen data or hacked files or, or any anything of that nature is is out there, and, and that's that could be the next October surprise, right? There's nothing. There's there's every reason to assume someone might try to inject either stolen emails or fake stolen emails into the public discussion next month. Um, but I think we, as the press, have to get better in terms of looking at the merits of things and saying, okay, so this was released. What does it actually mean and what does it actually tell us? Uh, and who might want us to overreact to this? What, what could the motives be of this release? And I think you have to be careful not to fall into the other trap, which is just assuming suspicion of everything and assuming that like it's all a game, it's all a magic show, like none of it's real, uh, because I think that's its own sort of trap. Um, but I do think we as the press would be better served by being a slightly more skeptical about the underlying value, news value of some of the things we cover. Uh, look, I'm an FBI reporter, a DOJ reporter. I'm always gonna cover the Clinton email case uh, when it's going on. Like there's no way I'm not doing that. But I think it's a very fair question to ask, should that case come to dominate the actual campaign for president where presumably people care about things like healthcare and the national debt and the military and all manner of things that are not, you know, the IT practices of the candidate. So presumably it was also just a piece of uh, grotesque, and I think I use that word advisedly, bad luck that, that Clinton's team had the story elevated by Anthony Weiner's underwear. You know, the, the, it became a tabloid story because of Anthony Weiner, didn't it? Otherwise, it would have been, as you say, a WikiLeaks story uh, and a sort of technical story. Absolutely, and there's, there's, it's hard to imagine a worse convergence of events for you know losing complete control of what's going on in in the news and and what's being discussed about your campaign than to have the you know. Uh, failed husband of one of your campaign staffers be engaged in criminal conduct and have that same staffer have used a computer in a way that even she doesn't understand to this day how those emails all got on her husband's laptop but they did and you know you couldn't have predicted that really in a million years uh the whole thing was highly bizarre but at the same time you know stuff happens and you have to make decisions and you have to use good judgment. Um, you know, did, when confronted with that set of facts, did the FBI use, make decisions and use good judgment? I, I think ultimately data shows that they did not use good judgment. They, they miscalculated their role in the world. Um, but yes, I mean, they're, one of the things that is sort of mind boggling to think about is that Anthony Weiner's personal problem uh, played a huge, hugely significant role in making Donald Trump the president. And that presumably would have happened even if, I mean, you were writing for the Wall Street Journal at the time, you're currently writing for the, the Washington Post. Even if both of those newspapers had said, we're not gonna to touch that story, it really is you know, somebody else's personal nightmare. But now social media has that story. They have those pictures. They would put that story out there in so many different ways and places that to some extent, somebody in the media is going to respond to it sooner or later. I mean, it's going to get folded into the whole, the whole Clinton quote unquote conspiracy. Um, and so 
you, you know, if you have something like Winner, it really, it's not just the press, it's like, it's all of us. It's our insatiable desire to, to enjoy the humiliation of somebody making a fool of themselves. Sure, but I do think, you know, as, as reporters, as folks with, you know, these websites that a lot of people visit every day, I think we have a lot of responsibility to put out the most responsible version of the facts. And, you know, I think it's fine for people to challenge us and push us when they think we have fallen short of doing that. I, I mean, there was never going to be any universe where, you know, Anthony Weiner's problems don't get covered. There was never going to be any universe where Hillary Clinton's emails don't get covered, or certainly not the investigation of her emails don't get covered. Um, but the but the guiding light for that process should be what is the most responsible and most accurate uh, way to describe those things and cover those things. Um, you know, like I said, I think there is a there's a bright shiny object problem in general uh, with some of this stuff, and I think we as reporters have to accept that you know on some days someone else is going to just make the object look shinier and brighter than you are. And I think hopefully what we do over time is we show by, by careful reporting that we are here to present the object exactly as shiny and exactly as new as it is and not, any, not embellish it, not you know, magnify it, report it as it is. And then hopefully that will just be enough of an appeal to, to an, a large enough audience to be, to be worthwhile. So let me ask you, uh, let's set aside your current employers on the Washington Post, but are you really confident that the people currently reporting on politics in the 2020 election and the editors to whom they're sending their reporting and the proprietors who own those newspapers and television stations and everything else that uh, covers politics, are you sure that they're, they are actually going to be responsible with the shiny objects or are they going to... I think so. I think I think there's two things that happen, right? I think one is um, we, like any other news, any other institution, any other part of society, we don't get it right every time in terms of we don't strike the right balance in, in every situation on every story. Um, and part of that is just because we always have to do sort of the first version of everything. You know, we're, we don't, we don't have the luxury of waiting three days if something happens if the if you know a, a building blows up in new york just to use a very crass example a building blows up in new york we need to tell you about it right now and there will be errors in the first telling like i, I you know it's it's not just a feature of political reporting it's a feature of humans that the first versions of things will have mistakes misjudgments uh misunderstandings um, and I think what you try to do is you try to establish a, a reputation and a track record of, of always refining and, and re-examining re and, and re-explaining as you go to get it as right as possible. Um, you know, one of the things I try to tell people when they tell me how much they distrust the media, I'm like, the first thing you have to understand is this is messy work. Like, this is not a bunch of people sitting around a, a college classroom, you know, drawing out diagrams. This is people running around a city trying to find people in hallways and get them to explain things as quickly as they can. It is inherently messy and it is inherently subject to not, not interpretation so much as different emphasis. And so I do think we're better positioned to deal with that now than we were then. But my, to be honest, my concern isn't if we're faced with the same thing in 2016, will we screw it up again? I actually think if we're faced with the same thing in 2016, I think we will perform better. My worry is what will the thing in 2020 be that we're not thinking of, that we're not prepared for, that is truly, sorry, an October surprise. And we haven't sort of gained out the way in our minds we have, you know, re-examined and rethought and, and challenged ourselves on 2016. Um, that's what I worry about in terms of like, you know, what could be a bad judgment or a bad, a bad piece of reporting work. If we see something so different that we don't have enough experience to make good judgment calls, like that's, that's what I worry about now, because I know these people and I work with these people, I have faith in them. But when I worry about, you know, all of us, that's my worry. 
I guess by the definition of it, an October surprise has to be a surprise. It right. can't be the same one as last time. Um, right. And, and you know, it's, it's the old, you know, gener all generals fight their last wars, right? I, I want to be prepared for what happened last time. But I also have to assume that it won't be just like last time. There, if anything, it'll be a little different and maybe it'll be a lot different and nothing at all like last time. Um, I just think you have to be thoughtful. Well, you know, I think you make the, the point um, very eloquently that in a, in a way, the October surprise is a, it's a unicorn. It happens very, very rarely. It's a malevolent unicorn. I don't know what the equivalent of a malevolent <laughs> unicorn is. Narwhal. Yeah, actually, I think narwhals are just fine. Um, right. Yeah, they're probably narwhals are probably less malevolent than uh, unicorns. Uh, but anyway, I think it, it, you know, in saying that, you you emphasize again what a truly astonishing story it was in 2016. Um, and uh, to anybody who hasn't yet found their way to your book, I wholeheartedly recommend it because I think it shows. Uh, the American institution, the political justice institution at its court, in one case, quite literally with its pants down. Um, and and it, cost, it cost an election. It swung an election. It changed our history. Uh, and that's an amazing story. And I'm really glad that you were able to bring it to us. Um, very glad you're able to join us today on The Current. Very glad that in the next few weeks between now and uh, our election in 2020, you'll be uh, you'll be vigilant on behalf of Rogue and other surprises. I am at my post, I promise. And thank you. Thank you very much, Clyde. Thank you very, very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Kevin. Hachette.